are uh, an issue to many Christians because they want to cling to the idea of being scientifically accurate on the one hand, and yet they have, they're troubled by the fact the Bible says uh, clearly six days. Or were the days more than 24 hours? Were they actually geological eras? There are many uh, authors that write books trying to uh, present a Christian viewpoint uh, arguing that uh, there are, they try to make this 16 billion year age of the universe compatible with the scripture. And our problem, of course, um, is, is uh, uh, not Genesis. It turns out to be Exodus. I'll come to that. The great discovery of 20th century science was that we live in a finite universe, which means it had a beginning. And the way they try to explain that beginning is with a family of theories called the Big Bang models, which essentially say first there was nothing, and then it exploded. And that may sound facetious, but that's literally what they say. The first one was a steady state model that Einstein himself admitted was his biggest mistake because it was discredited. Then there was a concept, a hesitation model, but that was refuted in the 1960s. Then there was an oscillation model that expanded and contracted and so forth. And that's refuted by the entropy laws and lack of mass and other issues. The current models are basically a variation of what they call the inflation model. The problem with this model, it requires anti-gravity forces that have never been observed, and it has a, a number of other problems. The whole Big Bang area is a, an area of continual adjustments and hypotheses and unprovable uh, theories and so forth. There's interesting, there is a stretch factor of the universe. It apparently is expanded to, by a, a factor of 10 to the 12th, according to conventional wisdom, which is based on the temperature of the quark confinement when matter frees out energy. And I won't go into all of that. Namely, this 16 billion year life of the universe, if it would be an expression uh, of the expansion factor. But what's interesting, Dr. Gerald Schroeder, who is a, one of the world famous nuclear physicists, he participated in the atomic bomb tests and so forth, he has his residence in Jerusalem. He wrote a marvelous book called Genesis and the Big Bang. Now, he's not a Christian. He's a Jew, brilliant scientist, and uh, a, a delightful friend. Uh, we, we spent a Passover together in his home. But it's interesting, if you take that expansion factor of 10 to the 12th, the 16 billion years represent, uh, essentially, uh, 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 6 billion billion uh, uh, days, or 10 to 6 to the 10 to the 12th days. And if you divide that by the expansion factor of 10 to the 12th, that's what you get. You get six days. To look at an exponential expansion, day one by this would, would account for 8 billion of those years, day two, 4 billion, two, the third day, 2 billion, and so forth. The, the sum being uh, 16 billion years as measured um, at, the, uh, at the perimeter of the, uh, of the universe. On a, on a, so the real question is, whose clock are you talking about? Adam wasn't on the earth when this was created. The only clock around was God's. And God clearly tells us that it uh, is uh, uh, six days. We'll get to that shortly. But one of the things that we need to be sensitive to is that modern science has approached the very boundaries of our reality and have recognized that. There are two concepts in mathematics, if you're in school, that you cannot find in the physical universe. One of them is randomness. We often talk about random numbers, but you'll discover if you're in the computer field, there's no such thing as a truly random number. You have pseudo-random generators that will generate numbers that have many of the properties of random numbers, but true randomness is an elusive concept. And uh, most of us have been trained with what's called deterministic models, uh, equa like equations, F equals MA or whatever, as you learn in science. But there's another field of study of stochastic models in which the, 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 it includes random variables. The field of advanced statistics uh, would uh, be embraced by the, this area. And... Uh, if you really study this area, you discover that the best you can get are pseudo-random numbers. Randomness is an elusive concept. That leads to a new theory in mathematics called the chaos theory, which deals with these issues. But randomness is very elusive to actually find. Well, that's exactly what the scripture says, by the way. It says the lot is cast in the, uh, into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And uh, so he's in control. And Albert Einstein said, God does not play dice. That was one of his rebuttals to some of these theories. And I always enjoy that because if God did play dice, the reason he doesn't play it, if he did, he'd win, right? So, uh, but moving on, the other concept that you cannot find in the universe, surprisingly enough, is infinity. We can conceive of it, we can deal with it mathematically, but we find it uh, uh, elusive. Um, in the macrocosm, the universe itself, you think by looking through a telescope, if it was good enough, you could see the, finally uh, see the fringe of the universe. 
the universe is finite and it uh, is not infinite. That's one of the great discoveries of, of modern science. But at the microcosm, that is in the, in the area of smallness, we're also startled to discover there is a boundary to smallness. You and I would think that if we took a line and cut it in half, what we, we could take what's left and cut that in half again. And you would think, at least conceptually, you could do that forever. However small you get, whatever's left, you could always cut in half. It turns out that's not true. There is a length. It happens to be 10 to the minus 35 centimeters, which if you cut it in half, it no longer has locality. Subatomic particles have a property that physicists call non-locality. The whole field of quantum physics is based on the discovery that whether you're talking about length or energy or mass or time, all these things are made up of indivisible units, things that you cannot split any, uh, any smaller. And uh, so we, are, we find ourselves then, as we examine these two boundaries, we are in a, a, a subset of a larger reality. We're bounded by quantum physics on the small end and a limited cosmos on the large end. We are in a virtual reality of a larger universe. And uh, the Planck length turns out to be 10 to the minus 33 centimeters that you can't make get smaller than. Planck time, you cannot find a unit of time smaller than 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Now, those are very small, but the point is they're indivisible. And that has profound implications in understanding our world. We are in a digital simulation. This, this podium looks, feels like it's solid. It actually is not by a factor of, of uh, 10 to the 15th, strangely enough. And we'll get into that in a moment. But the rea what we think is reality is actually a virtual reality within, in fact, a digital reality within a much larger context. And we... We, we can't see beyond our, our reality, but we know that we are a subset by uh, what we observe. And uh, now let's talk a little bit about physical chronometers. Uh, you know, the, uh, many of us talk about radiometric dating, carbon-14 dating and so forth. And the trouble with this form of dating, it's based on some assumptions. It's based on a known clock rate, that the clock was set accurately at the beginning and the clock was not disturbed during the measure. And it turns out that these are frail assumptions to build long uh, estimates of time on. This leads to a whole division in science of uniformitarianism, which means things have always been the way they are, or catastrophism, that where we are as a result of past catastrophes, collisions, and so forth. And the evidence is all in favor of catastrophism. And all you have to do to convince yourself of that is get a pair of binoculars and take a look at the moon and explain how those craters and things happened by uniformitarianism. Now, there's a number, it's astonishing to discover there are a number of indicators that indicate that our Earth is far younger than is commonly taught. The amount of moon dust, oil gushers, the Earth's magnetic field, the Mississippi River Delta, the salinity of the oceans, the pointing Robertson effect, I'll come back to that, and radio halos, and uh, these, these are just an example. There are 95 of these listed by Walt Brown in his books on, uh, on evolution and so forth, and I, I encourage you to take a look at those. Let's talk about moon dust. See, the lunar surface is exposed to direct sunlight and strong ultraviolet light and x-rays. These can all destroy the surface layer of the exposed rock and reduce them to dust. And it does this at the rate of a few ten thousandths of an inch per year. But even this minute amount during the age of the moon could be sufficient to form a layer several miles deep. But that's 